Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Should you buy a Skylake X system in 2018? Maybe, but probably not. Now I've talked about this topic in previous videos, but this is a refresh for January of 2018. I've recently done a review of this motherboard. I spent quite a bit of time overclocking it, running programs on it, etc. I have two Skylake X chips, an i9-7900X and an i7-7820X. And of course, I have a bunch of other machines to test against as well. What I'm going to be talking about is who should still be considering this versus who should be looking at something like a Ryzen or Coffee Lake CPU. First, let me make something very clear up front. From a simple price to performance point of view, none of the high-end desktop platforms make any sense if you're simply looking for value for the money. Yes, you can get up to 18 cores and 32 threads on this. Yes, you can get an incredible high-speed computer, but for the money you're spending divided by that performance versus less expensive platforms, you're paying a lot of money to get that premium performance. Pure performance is not really the reason to go here. Yes, they're faster, but not by so much to justify huge sums of money. The real value to Skylake X is in the quad channel RAM for people who run multiple virtual machines, people who are heavy multitaskers, or people doing a lot of data transfer, video encoding, 3D animation, uh, file encryption, that sort of thing. And the other thing is the PCI Express lines. If you need to attach a lot of devices to your system, 10 gigabit ethernet networking, multiple graphics cards for not necessarily gaming, but scientific use or compute applications, or if you're doing multiple NVMe drives. I have three NVMe drives on my Skylake X system that's currently installed under the desk, and you really couldn't do that on the consumer platforms. They don't have enough PCI Express lanes to handle it. Rather than give you a complex overview of all the available CPUs, I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you which two you should actually consider. Number one, if you're on a modest budget, but you have a need for the quad channel RAM, the extra PCI Express lanes, if your specific application needs a high-end desktop platform, but you really can't quite get into the i9s, the i7-7820X is a reasonable compromise. 8 cores, 16 threads, max out-of-the-box turbo speed of 4.5 with an all-core boost speed of 4.0 without overclocking. For 600 retail, although it's been discounted lately, you can find it in the 500-550 range, it's a reasonable option to get you to this platform. 28 PCI Express lanes direct to the CPU, that's enough to run 3 NVMe SSDs and a graphics card. It is not enough to run more than that, but it's a reasonable choice and a reasonable compromise. Now, if you want to do this platform right and you can afford it, the CPU to buy is the i9-7920X. In January 2018, when I'm filming this, it's only $100 more than the 7900, and it provides you with 20% more cores. That's an extreme value for the money. At current prices, I wouldn't buy a 7900. Buy a 7920X. 12 cores, 24 threads, 44 PCI Express lanes direct to the CPU. That's enough for a whole lot of expansion. Very few people would need more than that. Please note that both systems are going to have 24 platform PCI Express lanes through the chipset. Now that lets you connect a lot of devices, but they cannot all run at full speed at the same time because of the DMI link between the chipset and the CPU. But there are an additional 24 platform lanes in addition to either the 28 or the 44 lanes, depending upon which CPU that you pick. Now, I fully realize that an $1,100 processor, a $300 motherboard, etc., is quite expensive. Most people are not going to buy that, and most people shouldn't buy that. The only people who should be spending $1,100 on a CPU are either A, people who are just wealthy and don't care and want fancy cool stuff, which is fine. If the two of you watching who are millionaires, by all means, go buy yourself a 99, have a blast. But for everybody else, if you're making a living with your computer, if you do work that gets you paid and getting that work done faster will let you get paid faster, then yeah, this actually can pay for itself. Another consideration is if you're paying somebody to get work done and their time is worth money. If you're paying somebody 60, 80, or $100,000 a year to do 3D animation or video encoding or any type of application that's very heavily CPU bound, $1,100 for CPU is nothing compared to what you're paying them in salary. Most people don't fit into that group, but that's really what this is aimed for, is either professional users or just enthusiasts who, frankly, have a lot of money. Just a quick mention, there is a $2,000 option, the 18-core, 36-thread CPU. That is a beast. There's no value for the money there necessarily, except for maybe the 0.01% of people who really need that many threads, need this type of platform versus the server platforms, and can justify it based upon what they're doing. 
that's unlikely to be anybody watching my channel, but if it's you, fair enough. If you just won the lotto last night, if you're a millionaire and don't care, well, if you just want the best, there is a $2,000 option. Just be aware that you're paying a large premium for a relatively small jump in performance. It does have more cores, but the clock speed is lower, and so the actual raw performance is not the huge increase that you would expect going from 12 to 18 cores. Now, as nice as the Skylake X platform is, and it really is nice, I use it daily, it's under my desk right now, the reality is in terms of value for the money from a performance performance point of view is what you're looking at right here. This is a Ryzen 7 1700 CPU. The motherboard is half the price. It's about 160 versus the 320 of the X299 motherboard. A cooler is included with the Ryzen 7 1700 CPU and the CPU costs less. Eight cores, 16 threads, it runs just fine at 3.7 gigahertz on the included cooler, $290. This is $500 less expensive than the i7-7820X option for only about 20% less performance. Yes, the Skylake X is faster. The eight core 16 threads on the Skylake X platform is faster, but not massively so. You're talking about saving maybe 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes of render time every hour of H.264 encoding in Adobe Premiere between the two platforms. So there's a performance difference, but is there really $500 worth? That's why I said at the beginning of the video, the real reason to go to Skylake X is quad channel RAM, the PCI Express lanes for NVMe or 10 gigabit ethernet networking, multiple graphics cards for compute applications. It's the high-end platform itself and the PCI Express lanes. That's why you go to Skylake X more so than the performance. Now it's true. The i9-7920X with 12 cores, 24 threads will absolutely stop in terms of performance an 8 core, 16 thread Ryzen. But then of course there's Threadripper, which we're not gonna get into here, but that is actually something worth considering. And I will cover that here shortly in another video, but that's a separate conversation because the motherboards cost more, they need coolers, etc. Value for the money. If you're doing a YouTube channel, Twitch channel, if you're doing live streaming, if you're doing uh, video editing and video encoding on a casual or budget basis, Ryzen 7 is a far superior value for the money, total platform cost, upgradability, not having to buy an extra cooler, etc., compared to something like Skylake X. And most people watching my videos are much better off with a Ryzen 7 or a Coffee Lake if you prefer that than you are with a Skylake X or a Threadripper for that matter. Quick note, the Skylake X just launched summer of 2016, so it's not gonna be replaced for a while. In fact, it may not be replaced again until 2019. So if you're ready to buy today and you're going the Skylake X route, I think you're fine. Ryzen, on the other hand, is about to get a refresh. In April of 2018, we're expecting a launch of a refreshed second generation series of Ryzen chips. They're not gonna be a massive, huge improvement in performance. This is not Zen 2, it's just Ryzen refresh, but a couple hundred megahertz faster performance. There'll be a refresh 400 series of boards, although Ryzen refresh will work in the 300 series. AMD has promised four years of compatibility with their motherboards, which is very nice. And you're gonna get better RAM compatibility and a few extra features. If you're not ready to buy today, if you're thinking, well, this is great, but I'm gonna buy in March or April or May, well, sure, wait for Ryzen Refresh. But do keep your eyes out for deals. As retailers start to clear their inventory getting ready for it, you might find some sweet discounts and deals on the first generation of Ryzen processors. If the Ryzen 7 1700 drops down to, say, $250 and you can find a nice X370 motherboard for say $100 and you're okay with the performance, that might be a better deal versus the higher price at launch at least of Ryzen Refresh. That is the short and sweet comparison between these two platforms. They're both excellent. Now let me share with you my own use case, what I've done with them and what would I buy today if I was spending my own money. First, a timeline. Back in March of 2017, when Ryzen 7 launched, AMD was kind enough to send me the Ryzen CPUs. I did a Ryzen 7 build on my channel, and I ended up very quickly turning that into my daily driver. That actually replaced a six core 12 thread Broadwell E, and I discovered that eight cores when it comes to 4K video work really does make a difference. I used that machine continuously until late last year when I replaced it with Skylake X. Now, as I said before, Skylake X is faster, but the reality is for 4K 60 frame per second video editing, Ryzen 7 1700 at 3.7 gigahertz is just fine. Does a very nice job. 
As I mentioned before, the Skylake X system is faster and it is nicer. I built a Skylake X system for two simple reasons. Number one, I run a tech review channel. It's my job to play with these things, test them, use them, etc. And using an X299 Skylake X system as a daily driver is a great way to get far more experience with it than I ever would just throwing it on a test bench for a few days and using it that way. The second reason, and this is just total honesty here, Intel sent me a CPU and MSI sent me the motherboard. So it didn't really cost me that much. Now that's not going to apply to you of course. So let me share this honest assessment with you. If I had to spend my own money to upgrade a Ryzen 7 machine to a Skylake X machine, would I? Absolutely not. That makes no sense whatsoever, except maybe for 0.01% of you who desperately need the PCI Express lanes for a very special use case. The performance increase is nice, but it's not worth it. At the 8-core level, the i7-7820X, it's a 25% performance improvement, give or take, which is nice, but not remotely worth that amount of money. From the i9-7920X 12-core 24 thread, yes, it's a lot faster. Yes, it has 44 PCI Express lanes, but you're going to spend $1,500 on the CPU, the motherboard, and a cooler to get those 12 cores, 24 threads. From a value proposition, that's just nuts. Having said that, that is the answer I would give if I already had a Ryzen 7. Now, my Ryzen 7 replaced my 6-core Broadwell E machine, which was not necessarily smooth in all 4K 60 frame per second video. It was smooth-ish, but when it was working, you couldn't do anything else with it. It was fully tasked. This was a nice improvement in terms of smoothness, if not outright performance. If I didn't have a Ryzen 7, if I still had my Broadwell E, would I buy Skylake X? Yes, I actually would. If I had not had the benefit, this didn't exist, I would have upgraded my 6-core 12-thread Broadwell E machine to the i9-7920X 12-core 24-thread CPU. Very expensive at $1,500, but I make 4K video for a living. It makes sense in my use case. Now, why do I have an 8-core chip under my desk? As I said before, that's what Intel sent to me. I've asked them for the 12-core thread, and they said no, so that is what it is. Again, because I have that chip, is it worth me spending $1,100 out of my own pocket to go from an 8-core to a 12-core chip when I'm already on that platform? No. So when you ask the question, is it worth it, one of the things you have to do is, where are you coming from? The further back you're going, the more worth an upgrade is, whereas if it's just a modest upgrade, if you already have a relatively modern platform, then it doesn't necessarily make any sense. I would, by the way, give the same advice if you're on Ivy Bridge E or Haswell E as well, is Skylake X worth it? If you're the kind of person who was on those platforms, yes, it might very well be worth it. On the other hand, depending upon what you do, if you have Haswell E or Ivy Bridge E, frankly, Ryzen 7 might actually be a smarter upgrade. I mentioned before that Threadripper would get its own video. Not to worry, it will. But you really can't do a Skylake X video these days without at least mentioning it, because otherwise somebody in the comments would go, but, but, Threadripper. Yeah, I know, Threadripper. In terms of value for the money, there's a lot to be considered here. 16 cores, 32 threads. It's less than $1,000 for the CPU these days. The motherboards do cost a bit more, but still, all things considered, it's a lot of value for the money. A 10-core i9-7900X plus an X299 motherboard is almost exactly the same price as this CPU and an X399 motherboard. This is 20% faster in H.264 video encoding than the i9-7900X but it is slower in H.265 encoding. So it depends upon what you're doing. There are situations where the 10 and 12 core processors from Intel are faster than the 16 core processor from AMD. And there's situations where this is faster. It depends upon what you're doing. I personally, if I was spending my own money, I would buy the i9-7920X over this, even though that's 100 or 200 more, and it has four fewer cores. The first reason is, Many workloads stop scaling well beyond 10 or 12 cores. Adobe Media Encoder, for example, does scale fairly well, but it starts to fall off at some point, and it doesn't utilize all 16 cores as well as maybe, say, Handbrake would with transcoding, which actually is better multi-threaded than Adobe. Come on, Adobe, fix your program and make it better. The other factor to consider is clock speed. The i9-7920X will comfortably run at 4.4 gigahertz. Threadripper will not. 
you might get 4.1 if you're lucky on extreme cooling. 3.9 to 4.0 is realistically the limit. That extra clock speed, if you're gaming, does make a difference. And the i9-7920X, is it gonna be a better gaming CPU it, no, neither one should be used primarily for gaming. That's what Coffee Lake's for. But if you also game in addition to what you do, Skylake X is better for that in many respects than Threadripper would be. If you take gaming off the table and multi-threaded performance is the only thing you care about, yes, then this becomes the deal. But I'll cover that in more detail when I do a review on this. Having said all of that, if gaming is in fact your primary goal, if that's the primary use case, you shouldn't buy any of these. The Coffee Lake i7-8700K overclocked to 5 gigahertz on either a 280 millimeter liquid cooler or a large tower cooler such as a Dark Rock Pro 3 or an Arctura D15, that's what you should do. High frame rate gaming, high detail gaming, that's really where the performance is at for gaming. So this is all mostly best for non-gaming or mixed use workloads. Whereas pure gaming machines, well, that's what I did the $2,000 Cadillac build with the i7-8700K. When it comes to games, that thing is a beast. Having said all that, it's worth noting that the least expensive computer you will ever build or buy is the one you already have. If you have an aforementioned Haswell E or Ivy Bridge E, or perhaps just a standard Haswell or Ivy Bridge, if your current system is doing everything you need, if your games run well, if everything seems smooth, maybe you don't need an upgrade. Perhaps you can wait another year. Now, the Meltdown Inspector issues do kind of alter that a bit because if some of the older uh, Haswell and Ivy Bridge systems don't get updates for Spectre, yeah, there's that issue as well. Not a huge issue today in January of 2018, but if they don't get patched as we progress further into 2018, personally, that becomes a bigger concern. It is worth noting that for basic casual gaming and browsing Windows and just uh, doing normal stuff like email, Facebook, watching YouTube, an i5-2500 from 2011 with a 100R GTX 1050 actually does just fine. I have one of those downstairs, and I do game with my kids on that. World of Tanks, World of Warships, Overwatch, that sort of thing. So as nice as all this fancy expensive stuff is, do remember that it's not required for everything you might do with a computer. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it, remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below, questions and comments in the comment section. As always, check the links in the video description, links to everything that I talked about here to Amazon and Newegg will be down in the description below. Those are affiliate links, they do support the channel. If you found this interesting, helpful, or just entertaining, please consider using those when you're shopping. I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, I will see you in the next video.